So we have a very, very interesting scenario in this week's parasha. You have this epic war between Yaakov and the Malach of Esav. It almost doesn't make sense how this angel is attacking Yaakov and Yaakov, it says, the Pasuk tells us, the Pasuk tells us, Vayibose Yaakov levadoi, vayoobek ish imoi adaloi sashochar. Yaakov was left alone, and a person, an angel struggled with him, adaloi sashochar, until the morning. Vayar kiloi acholoi, vayigab bekafi erechoi. He saw that he was not able to beat him. He couldn't beat Yaakov. So he touched, uh, he touched him bekafi erechoi, he touched him on his thigh, and vateka kafierech Yaakov of koimoi, and he dislocated his uh, his thigh. His hip was dislocated. Vayomer shachini kolo ashochar. Vayomer lo ashan lechachokim berachtoni. He asked him. He says, "Okay, let me go. Let me go. Now it's it, the it's a crack of dawn. I gotta go. I have to give praise to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. It's my turn to leave." But Yaakov Vino says, "No, I'm not gonna let you go." Ki im berachtoni. I want you to give me a blessing first. So then he says, What's your name? And he told him, Your name is no longer going to be Yaakov, it's going to be Yisrael. Now it's interesting. Who is this Sarai Shel Esau? Who is this angel that belongs to Esau? Esau's guardian angel. Who is he? So he's called the Samech Mem. The Samech Mem is actually HaKadosh Baruch who created a human being which is a spiritual neshama in a physical body. But an angel only has a spiritual being. An angel is much different. And the Gemara says that an angel, a Malach, is a messenger. He's a shliach. That's why he's called, that's, that's a malach. He has a certain um, shlichus that he has to accomplish. The Gemara in Baba Basra tells us that who is this Samech Mem? Who is this guy? So the Gemara says this guy is the Yetzir Ara. He's the evil inclination. So he's, a, he's the guy that causes us to do something wrong, Right? And after he causes us to do something wrong, the Gemara also says, he's the one that gives us the illnesses, he's the one that causes us to lose money, he's the one that causes us punishment, and he's the one that eventually causes us death. He ends our life. So you can imagine how wicked this guy is, this spiritual being is. I mean, he's worse than Stalin. He convinces you to do bad, he prosecutes you on the bad that you did, he punishes, he punishes the individual, and eventually there's death. And this is the Tsar Shel Esau. This is Esau's angel. So we just got a little introduction about who this guy is and who Yaakov was dealing with. But the question is, Yaakov fights with him until the morning. And then Yaakov says, I'm not going to let you go until you give me a bracha. I just described to you how wicked this being is. What in the world, why would Yaakov ask him for a bracha? It doesn't make sense. You're going to ask a bracha from Stalin? You're going to ask a, bra a bracha from the Vuchadnezar? You're going to ask a bracha from the most wicked being in this world? How do you ask him for a bracha? What is Yaakov doing? And then listen to the response. What's the response of the Malach? The Malach tells him, okay, no problem, I'll give you a bracha. He changes his name. Anybody asked you to tamper with my name? My name is Yaakov, leave me alone. I asked you for a bracha, give me a bracha. What are you now changing my name for? But he changes his name. And Yaakov is, is satisfied. What is going on over here? What's the dialogue? What's the back and forth? So we know that this battle between Yaakov and Esau is a battle that not only was for that specific time, 
It's a battle and it's a struggle that we struggle with it until today and we're going to continue to struggle with that battle until Mashiach comes. But what's the root cause of this battle? So it's interesting. They did a study. They did a study in universities and they asked, is there a reason for anti-Semitism? Is there a logical reason for anti-Semitism, why do they, why do the nations of the world hate us? Is there a reasoning behind this? Now you have to understand, the Jewish nation, we're nice people. All we want to do is just live and let live. In fact, if somebody comes to convert to Yiddishkeit, to Judaism, we tell them, no, 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 it's not a good idea. Very, very difficult, right? The guy's, the guy's got to have a Gaisha cup to try to convert to Judaism. You're able to eat whatever you want to eat. You're able to do whatever you want to do. You have only seven mitzvahs that you have to watch out from. Right? But that's it. You're a free man. Don't convert. And we convince people not to convert. I have people that call me up many, many times. Rabbi, I want to convert. I tell them it's such a lengthy process, especially when people want to get married. One is not Jewish, one is Jewish, and now they want to convert. So that in itself is a tremendous issue. It's a tremendous issue. But even so, even if a person does the right thing and wants to convert for the right purpose because he wants to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, still, we convince that person that it's not a good idea. Be a good guy rather than being a mediocre Jew or a bad Jew, a Jew that doesn't keep. So we do whatever we can to convince the person, don't get into this. So again, why do they hate us? We're not trying to infringe anything on anybody. And not only that, the only time we are at war with people is just to protect ourselves. That's it. We're not trying to conquer people we're not interested in any of that. Not only that, if you look at the contributions that the Jewish nation has given society throughout the ages, it's so enormous. In fact, you have 25% of the Nobel Prizes were, were won by Jews. Now keep in mind that we are less than a half a percent of the world. So 25% are won by Jews and we're less than a half a percent of the world. That means we're contributing, whether in medicine, in science, in technology, we're contributing to the world so much. Why hate the hand that has helped you? Why hate the hand that has fed you? How does that make sense? So the truth is, there is no reasonable logic to why they hate us. There's no reasonable logic. And in fact, when they brought this up in the, in, in the universities, there was no real logic. There's no real logic. But there's a spiritual reason why they hate us. There's no reasonable logic, but there's a spiritual reason. See, we understand that this milchama, this war between Yaakov and Esau, was something that's going to continue until Mashiach. And in order to understand it, we have to go all the way back to the time that Yaakov and Esau were born. So, first you have, according to the Chazal tell us, that first Yaakov Avinu conceived. Yaakov Avinu was conceived. And after Yaakov Avinu was conceived, Esav was conceived, but he was lower down. So since he was lower down, he came out first, and Yaakov Avinu came out second. But really, who was the Bechar? Who was the firstborn? It was Yaakov, not Esav. Now, when Esav is born, he's called Esav. Why? Because he's called because of the name Asui. Asui means he came out complete. He had his full set of hair. He looked mature when he came out. Therefore, they called him. Esau, from the terminology of Asui. Yaakov, on the other hand, 
Why is he called Yaakov? Yaakov because he held on the Okev, on the Akev. The Akev is the ankle. As Esau was coming out, he was holding on, on his ankle. In other words, to demonstrate and to protest, no, I'm supposed to be the first one. I'm supposed to be the firstborn. And therefore, his name is Yaakov. But the question is, Asui is with a Yud at the end. Why does Esau lose, lose that Yud? And it's very interesting that Yaakov get, gains that Yud because he should have been called Akev. Akev is, is, is the ankle. That's where he grabbed. Why Yaakov? Why does Esau lose the Yud and Yaakov gain the Yud? So listen to something phenomenal. Because in a sense, Esau really was supposed to be child number two. But Yaakov did not want to fight with Esau. But it belonged to Yaakov. So therefore, Yaakov's mission was now to go and get the Bechayra back. What is La'akov achare mishu? La'akov means to follow somebody. Yaakov means that now his job in this world was going to be following Esau to, until he would be able to grab back what belongs to him. What belonged to Esau? What belonged to Yaakov? The Bechayra belonged to Yaakov. So now he's going to have to Follow Esau until he finally gets the Bechayr from Esau. So, it all begins. One day, Esau comes back after killing Nimrod. And Esau is all tired. Esau is worn out. He comes back home. And Yaakov Avinu is making a lentil soup. Why? Avram Avinu just died. And this was the food of mourners. Esau is so hungry and he's so tired that he tells Yaakov, Let me just drink this all up, this red stuff that you have. And Yaakov says, no problem. On one condition, Esau, give me the Bechayra. The Bechayra that is rightfully mine, give it to me. What does Esau do? Esau says, no problem. Loma Right? I'm going to die. What do I need the Bechayr for? You know, in a sense, what he was telling him? He was telling him that I understand that this idea of being a firstborn requires tremendous amount of responsibility. See, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when Avraham Avinu found HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he all of a sudden understood monotheism, that there's one God, there's one Abishta, there's one HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu appointed him that you're going to now disseminate this idea. You're going to resemble godliness. You're going to put godliness in this world. You're going to be that king. Your children are going to be kings. In fact, that's one of the reasons that we every morning... We dress up and we put a crown on our head. What's the crown that we put on our head? It's the tefillin. Every Jew puts on tefillin on his head. That's the crown. I'm a son of a king. And the talus, what's the talus? The talus is that kingly robe that a person dawns in the morning. Later, a person has to go to work. He takes it off, yes. But that's the first thing he does as he starts off the day. He remembers, I am the son of a king. But the son of a king has a lot of responsibilities. The son of a king has to talk a certain way, cannot marry anybody that he wants, eats only certain foods. He's, a, he's aristocratic. He can't just do what he wants. That's the son of a king. When Esau understands this and says, wait, I'm the firstborn, that means I'm going to have to now take this mantle of being the son of a king and having all these responsibilities, I don't want it. I'm going to die. I know I'm going to make mistakes. I can't live up to this. And therefore, Esau says, forget it. Take it. It's yours. It's yours. We fast forward. We fast forward to a point where Yitzchak now, who in Yitzchak's mind, Esav is the firstborn. 
He didn't know about this whole transaction. He didn't know Esav sold the Bechairah. So in his mind, Esav is the firstborn. So he tells Esav, Lechel asoda betzudo litzayit, go to the field, bring me something good to eat. You know why? Because Esav, now I'm going to bestow this bracha, this mantle of kingship, this concept where you're going to now carry this idea of being king and your children and your children's children. I'm going to now transfer that all over to you. Esav, you're the one. You're the firstborn. Rivka hears this, and Rivka knows of the deal. Rivka knows that Esav is no longer a firstborn, that Yaakov is a firstborn. So she right away tells Yaakov, go, go, go in there and get the bracha. And everybody asks, hey, Yaakov, how do you lie? How do you lie? But in reality, who's the one that's lying over here? Esav is lying. Because Esav claims to be a firstborn. You're no longer a firstborn. It doesn't belong to you. This transfer of kingship is not supposed to go to you. You're no longer the firstborn. It's supposed to go to Yaakov. See, Yaakov is actually telling the truth. And Yaakov goes in there. And Yaakov says, Ani, bin I'm your firstborn. And he ends up giving him the brachas. He ends up transferring to Yaakov Avinu, you are going to be the continuation of kingship. You and your children, you have that responsibility. What happens? We all know the story. Esau is about to walk in. Yaakov sees him from the window and he escapes. He escapes. When Esau comes in there and he says, hey, dad, sit up. I want to get the bracha. Vayechrad Yitzchok Harodo. Yitzchok begins to tremble. And he says, what do you mean? I already gave the bracha. I gave the bracha to somebody else. Somebody else is not going to be the king. And Esau says, oh my goodness, I know who this somebody else is. This somebody else is Yaakov. Vayakveni zepa amayim. He tricked me twice. What does ze mean? Whenever you have a ze in the Torah, it mean, it's pointing to something. You know what it's pointing to? It's pointing to that pot. That original pot that he made of lentils, ze, he tricked me with the Bechor over there. And now, ze, once again, he serves Yitzchak with the same pot. And he gets tricked twice. So Yitzchak says, wait a minute. Wait, he tricked you the first time? Meaning to say that you sold the Bechor? Which means to say that in actuality, when I gave the brachas to him, I did the right thing. Gam So then Yitzchak says, he should also be blessed. Why? Because Yitzchak understands. Now he sees the full picture. Oh, he gave the Bechorah to Yaakov. See, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took care of me. I didn't make a mistake. And I gave that kingship over to Yaakov. But we asked. We asked, what was the dialogue between the Malach and, ya and Yaakov. It was very interesting. Yaakov says, I'm not letting you go. Give me a bracha. Right? He says, no problem, I'll give you a bracha. He changes his name. So we asked, who asked you to change the name? You know what the dialogue was? Esau already, with this, agreed that, the, that he's not going to be the king, so to say. He's not going to be the one that will be the light onto the nations and show the entire world, how a person is supposed to act in the most spiritual form. It now became Yaakov's job. But there was somebody that didn't agree to this. Esau had no choice. Esau already lost the brachas. But you know who didn't agree to this? Esau's malach. So Esau's malach says, no way. I'm going to come and fight Yaakov. I'm not giving him that, that, that role. He's not going to have those brachas. Those brachas are a stamp that he's going to be the light onto the nations. No way. I'm going to take it away from him. So they go and they fight. And it's a very, very, it's a spiritual fight, but it's also a physical fight. But Yaakov, as he holds his own, and now this Samech Mem, this Malach of Esau, wants to escape. And Yaakov says, no, I got you down. You're not going anywhere. 
So Yaakov says, Borcheni, give me a bracha. What does that mean, give me a bracha? What he meant to say, is not give me a bracha. I don't need a bracha from a person like you. You're the lowest of the low. I don't need a bracha from you. I need you to agree that those brachas that were given to me are really mine. And I'm the one that will carry that mantle of the Jewish nation, of being a, a nation of kings. I'm going to be the one to carry it. And I want you to agree to it. And listen how beautiful this is. What does the Malach answer him? He says, you know, up till now, your name was Yaakov. What does Yaakov mean? Yaakov means that you have to follow and follow and get what's yours. La'akov achareh To go and follow a person until you finally grab what's yours. But Yaakov, you did that already. And since you did that already, your name is no longer Yaakov. I have to change your name now. Your name is Yisrael. What does Yisrael mean? How did you get all this? Because you are Yeshar Kel. Yeshar Kel means you went the straight way. You went the proper way. And because of that, through the fact that you went with HaKadosh Baruch Hu straight, you didn't make any tricks. You didn't fight with Esau in the beginning. Therefore, I'm going to change your name. Because the job of Yaakov is complete. The job of being okay, of following, is done. And therefore, therefore, your name from now on is Yisrael. Now, we have to understand, why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu allow this nation? You think about it, we're so few in numbers. We have between 13 million and 15 million. Right? And yet, the whole world is focused on us. Right? You have nations that have a billion people. You got China. If you look at the past year, how many, how many times... China was on the front cover of newspapers. And how many times Israel was on the front cover of newspapers? Israel is, what, we got six, seven, seven million Jews over there? And you got one billion Chinese? You know, I was talking to some people, giving a lecture. And they were saying, you know, we were, we were going back and forth. How many, how many billions of, of Chinese there are? So one guy says a billion, 100 uh, million, a billion 200 million. And then a third guy jumps in. He says, you know what? As we're talking and arguing, I bet you another 100,000 were born. That's the numbers you're dealing with when you're dealing with the Chinese. So why aren't they on the front covers all the time? Where are they? Why only the Jew? The answer is, B'derech Moshe. This idea of anti-Semitism is not because of them. It's a spiritual thing for us. One time there was a king, and this king saw, he had his child, and you know how teenagers are, they could be very, very difficult, very difficult. And every night this teenager would escape from the uh, palace, and he would go hang out with his friends, and he would, they would drink, and they would smoke, and they would, you know, they'd get into trouble. The king found out about this. He decides, I'm going to work all this out. He calls over all of his buddies, all of this teenager's buddies, and he tells them like this, listen to me, from now on, this is what you're going to do. When my son comes to you, you're going to slap him up and punch him up. You're gonna, and every punch that you give, give him, I'm giving you $100. Every punch. Okay? The son that night escapes the, the house. They like it. They have free money. And they punch him, and they write down one punch, another punch. Each guy is writing down. They have the tally. At the end of the next morning, they come to the king. The king pays them up. This child again, once again, the next night, boom, bang, boom, bang, boom, bang. After a while, the next day, the third day, the kid doesn't leave the palace anymore. Done. He doesn't leave the palace. He doesn't want to hang around with these guys. These guys are nuts. HaKadosh Baruch Hu works the same way. When we're in his palace, HaKadosh Baruch was fine. He wants us in his palace. That's where he wants us. That's where we belong. But when we get out of the palace and we go hang around with the wrong people, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, go punch them up. I need these kids by me. That's where they belong. They don't belong anywhere else. So we want to understand 
What's the idea of anti-Semitism? Where does it come from? It's not something that's logical. We give the world so much. There's no reason in the world why they should hate us. But it's something spiritual. It's something spiritual which was created through the Malach of Esau. That he's the one that convinces us to do bad. He's the one that then executes the punishment. Why? It's a spiritual thing. To keep us in line constantly. And therefore, when we experience anti-Semitism, we have to understand why it's happening. We shouldn't think, oh, you know what? We'll mingle more with the Goyim. We'll be nicer to them. We'll go to their parties. And then, you know, everything is going to be okay. Just the opposite. That's exactly when God is going to send those people to give us punches. No, go back to the palace. This is not where you belong. So this was the idea. This was the concept. This was the reason. And this was the place that anti-Semitism began. Did it have any logic to it? It, did, it didn't have any. Does it have any logic today? You go ask the universities, what do you hate about Israel? They've made so many inventions. They made your life easier in so many, so many ways. There's no reason for you to hate them. Nobody will have a real answer. Nobody will have a logical answer. They, hate, they don't know themselves why. It's a spiritual reason. It's a spiritual reason because we are God's children. We have the mantle of a king. We put that crown every single morning, that crown of tefillin. We, do, we don our talit. That's the robe that a king wears. And we have to remember that we're the children of Hashem and Hashem wants us only in the palace. May we succeed Be'ezrat Hashem to always follow HaKadosh Baruch Hu's way. And this is, will be the primary way where we will eliminate completely any vestige of anti-Semitism. There will be no reason for anyone to hate us if we're inside the king's palace. Thank you for listening.